and friends and visitors, welcome to the African Methodist Zion Church of Syracuse, New York. We are pleased that each and every one of you are in attendance today. We have gathered together this afternoon to receive a report from Reverend J.W. Logan, who attended the recent Colored National Convention that took place in Rochester, New York on July 6, 7, and 8, 1853. Many of you know that Reverend Logan has been active in this community and all over New York State and beyond for many years in advocating for equal rights and justice for our colored brethren. Reverend Logan was an active and vocal participant in what has been called the Jerry Rescue back in October of 1851, and he was forced to leave his wife, family, and friends for a season as a result of his commitment to justice and truth. But Reverend Logan is again amongst us and has returned more determined than ever to fight for freedom, justice, and equality wherever ignorance, injustice, and inequality are found. As our representative at the Colored Convention, we now bring Reverend Logan to the lectern for him to give his report of the proceedings and activities that took place and to inform us of what is now expected of the colored citizens of Syracuse as we move forward. Hear him and receive him with a round of applause, Reverend Jermaine Wesley Logan. I tell you these 
things about myself this afternoon. Because my mother was on my mind when I laid down last night. You see, I haven't seen my mother in all those 20 years. I don't know if she lives or if she has gone home to be with the Lord. And when I rose early this morning, <laughs> my mother was still on my mind. It is true that my friend John Thomas and other citizens of Cortland, New York, attempted to purchase my mother from Manasseh Lowe, her so-called owner and my biological uncle. Her so-called owner and my biological owner. This was back in 1844. And they did this as a demonstration of their respect and appreciation of my manhood. <coughs> John Thomas negotiated a price of $250 with Manassas to purchase my mother. Saints, I've asked myself on many occasions, was that all my mother was worth? $250? Was, was that a price that is <laughs> for a human being made in the image and the likeness of the God who sits high well, and looks low? Yes. But I remind myself that our Lord and Savior was sold to the St. Heaven for 30 pieces of silver. So I guess I should not complain. Mr. Thomas's agent, Nathaniel Goodwin, traveled to Tennessee to pay Manasseh and to procure my mother. Mr. Goodwin met my mother in 1844, and he told me that my mother appeared to be about 60 years of age then, and she was stout and healthy, but her neck was bent, and her heavy footfall told of age and hardship. When Mr. Goodwin met my mother in 44, he asked her if she ever had a son named John. You see, in slavery, they didn't call me Reverend Jermaine Wesley Logan. They called me John. Nothing more, nothing less. They called me John. My mother told Mr. Goodwin that her son John had died long ago. My mother thought that I was dead. When he told my mother that I was not dead, that he had been with me just a few days hence, and that his friends had sent him to buy her so that she could come and live with me and her daughter-in-law and her grandchildren mm -hmm. in Syracuse. Mr. Goodwin told me that tears welled up in my mother's eyes and that her body shook with emotion. Mm -hmm. During his interview with my mother, Mr. Goodwin told me that my sister Anne entered the room. She had been sold to a neighboring plantation. And that from her physical stature and her appearance, that he could tell that she and I were related. However, when Manasseh discovered that I would be the beneficiary of my mother's purchase, Manasseh refused to sell my mother to him. And he, he quoted the slaveholder's adage, you shall not sell a slave to a slave. You shall not sell a slave to a slave. Meaning that since I had taken my God-given right of freedom and had refused to let anyone pay anyone for my freedom, he 
Manasseh still considered me his prophet. Mr. Goodwin returned to Syracuse to court empty-handed. And this was in 1844. But although he was not able to purchase my mother and to bring her back to Syracuse, at least I found that my mother and my sister Anne still live. But that was almost 10 years ago. And in the intervening years, I've had no correspondence, no confirmation as to the whereabouts of my mother, whether she or my sister still live or have passed on. Tell the church, my mother stays on my mind. Yes. I see in attendance this afternoon, Sister Mac. Yes. And she's a member of the choir here at Zion. Sister Mac, will you please come forth and, and give us just a verse or two mm -hmm. of that song, Motherless Child, and perhaps it shall soothe. Sometimes I feel like a mother's child. Sometimes I feel like a mother's child.
Fred Douglas published a call for a national convention mm -hmm. in his newspaper, mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass's paper. In part, it read, fellow citizens, in the exercise of liberty, which we hope you will deem unwarranted, and which is given us in virtue of our connection and identity with you, the undersigned do hereby most earnestly and affectionately invite you by your appropriate and chosen representatives to assemble at Rochester, New York on the 6th of July, 1853, under the form and title of a national convention of the free people of color of the United States. Our fellow countrymen, now in chains, to whom we are united in a common destiny, they demand it. And a wide solicitude for our own honor and that of our children impel us to this course <coughs> of action. We have gross and fragrant, fragrant, flagrant wrongs against which, if we are men of spirit, we are bound to protest. We have high and holy rights, mm -hmm. which every instinct of human nature and every sentiment of manly virtue mm -hmm. bid us to preserve and protect to the full extent of our ability. Mm -hmm. We have opportunities to improve difficulties peculiar to our own condition to meet, mm -hmm. mistakes and errors of our own to correct. And therefore, we need the accumulated knowledge and the united character and the combined wisdom of our people to make us, under God, sufficient for these things. The Fugitive Slave Act, the most cruel and unconstitutional and scandalous outrage of modern times, the proscriptive legislation of several states with a view to drive our people from their borders, the exclusion of our children from schools supported by our money, the prohibition of the exercise of the franchise, the exclusion of colored citizens from the jury box, the social barriers erected against our learning trades, the wily and vigorous efforts of the American Colonization Society to employ the arm of the government to expel us from our native land, and will the perpetuous awakening to the fact of our condition at home and abroad, which has followed the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, called Trumpet Tone, for our union, cooperation, and action in the premises. Among the matters which will engage the attention of the convention will be a proposition to establish a national council of our people <laughs> with a view to permanent existence. This subject is one of vast importance and should only be disposed of in the light of wise deliberation. There will come before the convention matters touching the disposition of such funds as our friends abroad, through Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, may appropriate to the cause of progress and improvement. In a word, the whole field of our interest will be open to inquiry, investigation, and determination. This call was signed by 42 individuals representing nine northern states. Now, many of you know that the first annual convention of the people of color took place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, back in 1830. And so this call for free people of color to come together and meet and discuss and plan for our future was not new. Colored national conventions took place annually from 1830 through 1835. But after 1835, they were sporadic. There was one in 1843 in Buffalo, 1847 in Troy, 1848 in Cleveland, Ohio. Five years have transpired since our last national convention. I will witness that the sporadic nature of our national convention does not mean that many of us have not been involved in regular local and statewide conventions, especially here in New York State, regarding the issues that plague us citizens of color, the franchise, 
the separate and unequal education of our children, our being denied the ability to serve as jurors and in the militias, and other issues which limit and retard our ability to function as citizens of the state and citizens of these United States. As an example, I attended and participated in the 1840 Convention of Colored Inhabitants of New York State. It was held in Albany, and at the time I was still residing, not here in Syracuse, but in Utica, New York. At the 1840 State Convention, it was called to lobby New York State to remove the requirement that colored men, that colored men had to possess $250 of unencumbered property to be able to vote in the state. At that convention, I walked beside young and old, men of merit, intelligence, and determination, such as the Reverend Thomas James, who founded this very church congregation that we stand in this afternoon, and several others, such as Austin Stewart, who was elected president of that convention in 1840. Henry Highland Garnett, Stephen Myers, Alexander Kamel, and many, many others. Although the referendum to remove <clears throat> that $250 property requirement lost in 1846, we still are fighting for it and are trying to get it removed. But the, about the color convention held over in Rochester on Wednesday, July 6th, in Rochester, it was a beautiful day. I saw friends and acquaintances I had not met in months or years, and I met many new friends and acquaintances at the convention. 140 delegates registered for the Rochester Convention, and that was by far the largest contingent of delegates who had ever registered for a national convention of color. We assembled in Corinthian Hall. Now, it is a spacious, beautiful building with marble columns on the stage. It sits on exchange place behind the Reynolds Arcade building. You may remember that it was the site of Frederick Douglass's 5th of July speech just last year. In the morning session, we presented our credentials and a committee was appointed to nominate the convention officers. In the afternoon session, the Reverend James W.C. Pennington, Doctor of Divinity, was elected president of the convention. Reverend Dr. Pennington was one of only two delegates to attend this convention in Rochester who had also attended the very first colored convention in Philadelphia 23 years earlier. Seven vice presidents were appointed, including Mr. Douglas, William H. Day of Ohio, and John B. Vachon of Pennsylvania. Now, John B. Vachon is the father of George Boyer Vachon, the first black man to be admitted to the bar who lives right here in Syracuse since 1850. Both Mr. Vachon and myself were signers to the call for this convention. A business committee and a finance committee were appointed to manage the funds of the convention. Frederick Douglass was named chairman of the committee on the declarations of sentiments and drew up the address of the colored convention to the people of the United States. Now, I was able to attain the booklet from this convention, and I shall read parts of Mr. Douglass' speech. The address of the Colored National Convention to the people of the United States, not just to the colored people, but to all of the people well, of the United States. Yes. Fellow citizens, met in convention as delegates, representing the free colored people of the United States, charged with the responsibility of inquiring into the general condition of our people, and of devising measures which may, with the blessing of God, tend to our mutual improvement and elevation. 
conscious of entertaining no motives, ideas, or aspirations, but such as are in accordance with truth and justice and are compatible with the highest good of our country and the world. With a cause as vital and worthy as that for which nearly 80 years ago, your fathers and our fathers bravely contended, and in which they gloriously triumphed, we deem it proper on this occasion as one method of promoting the honorable ends for which we have met and of discharging our duty to those in whose name we speak. We are Americans. We are Americans. We would speak as Americans. We address you not as aliens, nor as exiles, humbly asking to be permitted to dwell among you in peace. But we address you as American citizens asserting their rights on their own native soil. Neither do we address you as enemies, although the recipients of innumerable wrongs, but in the spirit of patriotic goodwill. In assembling together as we have done, our object is to obtain justice for our people. We are not malefactors imploring mercy, but we trust we are honest men, honestly appealing for righteous judgment and ready to stand or fall by that judgment. We ask that speaking the same language and being of the same religion, worshiping the same God, owing our redemption to the same Savior, and learning our duties from the same Bible, we shall not be treated as barbarians. We ask that having the same physical, moral, mental, and spiritual wants common to other members of the human family, we shall also have the same means which are granted and secured to others to supply those wants. We ask that the doors of the schoolhouse, the workshop, the church, the college shall be thrown open as freely to our children as to the children of other members of the community. We ask that the American government shall be so administered as that it beneath the broad shield of the Constitution, the colored American seaman shall be secure in his life, liberty, and property in every state of this union. We ask that as justice knows no rich, no poor, no black, no white, but like the government of God, readers renders a life to every man, reward or punishment according as his work shall be, the white and black man may stand upon an equal footing before the laws of this land. We ask, since the right of trial by jury is a safeguard to liberty against the encroachments of power, only as it is a trial by impartial men drawn indiscriminately from the country. Colored men, colored men shall not in every instance be tried by white persons, but that colored men shall also be able to sit in the jury box. Yeah. We ask that inasmuch as we are in common with other American citizens, supporters of the state, subject to its laws, interested in its welfare, liable to be called upon to defend it in a time of war, contributors to its wealth in time of peace, the complete and unrestricted right of suffrage, which is essential to the dignity, even of the white man, be extended to the free colored man yeah. also. Yeah. Mr. Douglas concluded his remarks with these comments. By birth, we are American citizens. By the Declaration and principles of the Declaration of Independence, we are American citizens. Within the meaning of the United States Constitution, we are American citizens. By the facts of history and the admissions of American statesmen, we are American citizens. Yes. By the hardships and trials endured, 
by the courage and fidelity displayed by our ancestors in defending the liberties and in achieving the independence of our land, we are American citizens. One of the major undertakings of the convention in Rochester that was suggested in the call was the establishment of the National Council of Colored People. Dr. James McCune Smith of New York City set forth the plan as the chairman of the business committee and he presented the National Council of Colored People's report. The council outlined that four members from each of the 10 northern states would be members of that council. And the National Council would have four standing committees. The Committee on the Manual Training School, which I will speak about later. The Committee on Business Relationships. Now this committee would establish a large scale employment office for our people of color around the country. The Committee on Publication, which would compile records, statistics, and history of every phase of Negro life including biographies and books written by Negroes. And fourthly, the Committee of Protective Union, which would establish a cooperative where Negroes could buy and sell staples such as foods and manufacturers from one another. Each of these committees will meet monthly, and the National Committee will meet biannually, receive reports, and make plans for the general good. It was obvious to me that much work and thought had went into conceiving of this National Council and that if implemented correctly and carried through, much good and uplift of colored citizens could be done by it. It will be our responsibility, citizens of Syracuse, to meet in the coming months and to elect members to the state committees to the National Council. The Committee on the Mac Manual Training School was charged with acquiring funds to organize and erect a school that would teach colored youth the agricultural, mechanical, engineering, and literary arts. These were deemed to be necessary to elevate the colored race from where we are now to where we want to be in the future. Professor Charles L. Reason read the report on the Committee on the Manual Labor School to the convention. His report ended with this paragraph. Let us educate our youth in such wise as shall give them means of success adapted to their struggling condition, and ere long, following the enterprise of this age, we may hope to see them filling everywhere positions of responsibility and trust and gliding on the triple tide of wealth intelligence and virtue reach eventually to a sure resting place of distinction and happiness. Amen. Pending the motion to adopt Professor Reason's report, Mr. Douglas read a letter that he had written to Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, who has intimated that she and perhaps some of her supporters in Europe may, might be interested and supporting a mechanical school for Negroes right here in these United States. Yeah. Regrettably, not all of the delegates at the convention favored this manual school training idea. Charles L. Remont and George T. Downey, they argued against it as they saw it as too costly and that a segregated school would be a capitulation to those who saw us unable to compete with whites. But Douglas, Dr. McCune Smith, and convention president, Reverend Dr. Pennington, led the support for the school, arguing that it would produce skilled workers and that the presence of an industrious, enterprising, upright, thrifty, and intelligent free black population would be a killing reputation of slavery. The convention, in the end, voted to pursue the manual training school. Another major issue that was dealt with forthrightly at the convention was the issue of colonization. Mr. R. R. Gurley, the executive secretary of the American Colonization Society, even came to Rochester and made a presentation to our convention. 
although it is common knowledge that many Negroes from America have voluntarily, and in some cases involuntarily, mm -hmm. left the United States to immigrate to Canada, to Haiti, to Jamaica, South America, and some to Africa, the forced colonization of all free people of color in the United States to Liberia, away from our enslaved kinsmen in the South, is repugnant to all but the lowest kind of colored man. Reverend Dr. Pennington was the chairman of the Committee on Colonization and wrote a wonderful and insightful report on the history of the Dutch colonization in South Africa the British colonization in Africa, and the current American colonization of free peoples of color in Liberia. The current Liberian government of President Joseph J. Roberts, Reverend Dr. Pennington asserted, was largely under the controlling influence of the American Colonization Society, several of the slave states, and pro-slavery individuals. Reverend Pennington wrote, Unless all and every one of the present schemes of colonization in Africa be utterly discarded and a pure system of gospel evangelization be adopted in the stead thereof, Africa is destined to be the theater of bloody conflict between her native sons and intruding foreigners, black and right for a century to come. All right. mm -hmm. Reverend Pennington went as far as to write that the Liberian government itself was in league with the worst enemies of Africa's dearest interests. The convention's stand regarding colonization came as resolutions adopted <coughs> by the convention <coughs> to wit. Result that the attempt to create a successful colony on the coast of Liberia is an attempt to accomplish an end in violation of the admitted laws of human civilization and in violation of the physical laws of the human constitution. Result that as for the American Colonization Society, we have no sympathy with it, having long since determined to plant our trees on American soil and repose beneath their shade. Mm -hmm. Result that the several towns and cities represented to this convention be and are hereby advised to procure copies of Garrison's thoughts on colonization and that they be advised to reiterate the results and addresses contained in the first part of the work under the head of free people of color. I won't go into some of the reports from the convention, but others that were made was the convention, uh, Committee on Social Relations and Polity that was made by Ethiop, Mr. William J. Wilson, and the Committee on the Importance of Colored Persons Engaging in Commercial Pursuits by Mr. Downey. In Mr. Douglas's call for this convention, he stated that the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was the most cruel, unconstitutional, and scandalous outrage of modern times. In Mr. Douglas's address of the National Convention to the people of the United States, he stated the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was a legislative monster of modern times by whose atrocious provisions the writ of habeas corpus and the right of trial by jury had been virtually abolished. We, the freedom-loving citizens, the anti-slavery citizens, the abolitionist citizens of Syracuse, have made the act of no effect here. We met at City Hall, over 300 of us, on October 4th, 1850, to debate what this city should do in response to the passage of that law, and we overwhelmingly voted to make Syracuse an open city, meaning that if any man, woman, or child was attempted to be taken from our city back into slavery, we, the citizens of Syracuse, would fight to the death to free them. When on October 1st, 
1851, our mettle and resolve was challenged. We met that challenge as becomes God-fearing Christians. We, the citizens of Syracuse, black and white, male and female, we freed Jerry from the clutches of man-stealers and set him free. Yeah. The color convention in Rochester has inspired all those who attended to work harder and longer to make ourselves worthy of the Appalachian citizens. Mm -hmm. Through your efforts here in Syracuse, we will succeed. All right. The Lord has not seen fit to release my mother from that house of bondage in Tennessee. But I believe in my heart God, that one day, one day we will see one another again. Yes. And we shall embrace and we shall cry salty tears mm -hmm. together. And until I am proven wrong, I will claim that my mother yet lives and is returning, waiting for my return to her arms. All right, yes. I shall always remain your servant and your friend, the Reverend Jermaine West.